Are you ready for anything? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, hello. People are still coming in, but um, I think it's uh, we should uh, get started. Uh, a very welcome to all of you. I'm very glad to uh, welcome you to this second webinar on the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. Uh, this webinar is uh, held in cooperation together with uh, WWF, UNPRI and Allianz. My name is Jacqueline Duiker and I'm Senior Manager of Sustainability and Responsible Investment at FIBDO. So in this webinar, uh, the coming hour and a half, we aim to convey a meaningful dialogue between um, um, asset owners interested to join the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance and experts uh, driving the alliance. Oh, the next slide. I would like to start um, with a little bit of context before we uh, go to the speakers. Of course, as we all know, uh, the Paris Agreement and IPCC reports on global warming have established a uh, consensus on climate goals and a need to make haste on reducing greenhouse gas emissions to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. However, investment flows are currently not aligned with this goal. Though many investors do have formulated policies and ambitions, they are often long-term goals and with little present implementation. This was illustrated actually yesterday in the newspapers when the PBL, the Plan Bureau for the Leefomgeving, announced that the Dutch financial sector will most likely not realize the ambitious ambitions of the Dutch climate agreements they signed up to. There's simply not enough CO2 reduction. There's an expected 34% uh, reduction, uh, but an agreed reduction of 49%. And pension funds uh, were quoted to not like the uncertainty and seem to prefer the certainty of failing to realize these goals. In spite actually of an abundance of uh, money in the market. So the question is, where is the change? And uh, well, this is actually exactly what the Zero Asset Owner Alliance uh, was established for bringing together asset owners that commit to transitioning their investment portfolios to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, consistent with a maximum temperature rise of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. That's the goal. The Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, or AOA if I may, is directly linked to the private finance program of the COP26 to be held at the end of this year. And it's also one of the race to uh, net zero initiatives that's part of the recently announced Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. This is an initiative we will hear, hear about later in the webinar. To date, the AOA is joined by 37 institutional investors representing almost 6 trillion assets under management. Now, as one of the front running countries in responsible investment, it could be expected that a number of Dutch asset owners would be part of this coalition. Though surprisingly, this is not yet the case. There's just only one Dutch pension fund that has in fact joined the AOA to date. For the past few months, uh, the FIBDO has been engaging with Dutch asset owners on why this is. We've been working together with WWF and UMPRI. We're actually both part also of the UNFCC COP26 coalition to assess the interest of the Dutch asset owners to join the AOA and find out their most important questions and considerations on, on this. So from all that, we learned uh, a lot and two things really stood out in the feedback we all received. Um, firstly, it is that fortunately a number of the asset owners that state that they are in fact quite ambitious when it comes to climate change, and they wonder if the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance is ambitious enough to live up to their standards, especially when it comes to realizing real-world impact. And the other thing that stood out is that um, uh, pension funds responding, listen, there are already so many initiatives around, so what is the added value of yet one more? These two questions and much more information on the working of the Asset Owner Alliance will be addressed by two excellent speakers in the webinar in the next hour. So let me go to the speakers. Um, 
First, uh, we will hear from Elke Vijver. Elke is Senior Specialist uh, with the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, uh, for which she is currently seconded and working at the PRI office. She leads work across the alliance, as well as the financing transition work, work track, and also recruitment. Prior to this, Elke developed and was responsible for global investment performance measurement and reporting for more than 50 Allianz entities worldwide. In her presentation, Elke will explain how the AOA works and she will focus on this real world impact approach and ambitions. Then following her, um, we will hear from Udo Riese. Udo is the global head uh, of risk and monitoring at Allianz Investment Management. And Udo is also on the board of the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change the IIGCC. So from both positions, Udo aims to build momentum to make the transition to a more sustainable future. And as a board member of the IIGCC and also with an active role within the AOA, Udo is very well positioned to share his vision on how the AOA relates to all the other initiatives around CO2 reduction. And then we will close with uh, Nicolas Polen. Nicolas <clears throat> is the Sustainable Finance Advisor uh, to the Green Finance uh, Unit at WWF Netherlands. He coordinates the Sustainable Finance Netherlands program, aiming to initiate and catalyze activities related to the Dutch financial sector and related international programs. WWF is also part of, of the UNFCC COP26 coalition. And Nicholas will have the honor of making a few concluding closing remarks at the end of this webinar. But let's um, get started. And, um, so just um, to get to know a little bit of one another as much as possible in this online environment, it would be nice if everyone online could share their name, uh, their organization, and maybe from um, where they're working. This will uh, Give us on a, a feeling of well with whom we're all talking this morning then uh, i would uh, appreciate very much if everyone except for the speakers of course uh, will mute themselves um, if you have questions please use the chat to ask the questions and we will uh, answer the questions after the presentations and then the, rec uh, the webinar is going to be recorded and it will be available uh, on the video website uh, for you to hear back if you like. Okay, then we go to Elke Pfeiffer. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. And um, I hope uh, I can answer your questions. If not, we have the Q&A in the end. So thank you very much for inviting us, the UN convened Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance to this event and giving me the opportunity to elaborate how can real-world impact be achieved by asset owners and by the Alliance specifically. Please do the next slide. Um, but first of all, um, well, yes, this is all the logos. Um, so the, the asset owners in the Alliance, uh, please uh, uh, flip to the next slide. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. But first of all, as uh, not everyone had been in the meeting organized by VBDO in November last year, a brief introduction of the Alliance key elements. The first key element is the commitment. The commitment is um, to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 of investment portfolios, um, setting intermediate targets every five years, starting 2025 with a regular reporting on progress uh, every five years in public, annually, uh, it is an internal reporting. But we emphasize this needs to be achieved by reduction of real in economy outcomes, and therefore engagement is key, which is reflected in the target setting, and I will explain later. Um, as um, Jacqueline already explained, so for now we are 37 asset owners, with uh, close to 6 trillion uh, assets under management, which is a strong signal uh, to policymakers and uh, to the real economy. The second um, element, uh, thank you very much, um, is uh, the theory of change, which is basically uh, the basis 
of the target setting, but also of our work. The Alliance had been founded in the first place to have real world impact, providing a platform for asset owners to drive impact via various tools and engagement possibilities. So it's not only about target setting um, and this commitment, it's really a, a community working together to have um, real world um, achieve real world um, uh, impact as a group. This is why the Alliance had been founded. And um, the, the theory of change is basically like four layers. First of all, as I said, and you see here marked in green is kind of on the macro level, achieve real world impact via engagement. Engagement um, uh, manifold, company engagement, sector engagement, asset manager engagement, but also and, and mainly policy advocacy, one of the most important uh, engagement um, yeah, needs um, to achieve um, uh, new regulations, um, I will explain later. Um, also, uh, enhancing the supply side of climate solution investments, so um, to, to engage uh, and to work together with different organizations um, to see and to push capital flows into uh, clean, um, into climate solutions in new technologies. This is also one of the key themes. In addition, of course, and this is then more on the, let's say, company micro level, it's, it's reallocation across sectors and asset classes and reallocation within one sector, which is then the best in class approach. And together with those four layers, you will, uh, we, we believe we can have real world impact because if um, many organizations and asset owners steer according to a clean transition, um, via capital reallocation strategies, but also engaging, um, then uh, we, we, we will achieve what we want to achieve, uh, seeing change in the real economy. This is basically the, the theory of change. And this is then the third key element. Please uh, flip to the next slide. Um, so the basis, um, so based on the theory of change and based on the commitment, um, the alliance members aligned uh, for this kind of a target setting. It's a target setting with four different layers. Um, it's in, we, we set engagement targets, um, financing transition targets, but also uh, portfolio or sub portfolio decarbonization targets here. Um, for the first five years, we propose a range of minus 16 to minus 29% of carbon emission reductions by the year 2025 base year. Uh, uh, 2019, uh, which can be achieved um, uh, by absolute or intensity based uh, reduction. And last but not least, a sector decarbonization target, um, which is an intensity based reduction target uh, for the highest to abate uh, sectors. Um, with this is a five years roadmap um, for the interim target setting, and um, the Alliance members strongly. Um, um, strongly believe that only if those four targets are set, um, this is um, of highest real world impact. Therefore, we recommend to set those four targets, but we state that th at least three out of those targets should be set. The engagement target being mandatory because engagement is key as uh, stated before for having real world impact. And this is a very strong signal that already 19 Alliance members set um, a five years target. Uh, please check on the website. Um, you see the specific target of the 19 Alliance members. Um, the guidance we give, uh, we ask uh, asset uh, owners joining the Alliance after a one year grace period to set a, uh, a target in, in line uh, with this target setting protocol in line with this target setting details you find on our website in, in the target setting protocol. And fourth, the fourth key element, uh, please, to the next slide. The fourth key element, and this is uh, where I want to stay a little bit longer on the next slides, is achieving real world impact uh, by uh, the working groups, by building a community, commonly engaging with uh, different stakeholders. Um, so we have work tracks, which are also kind of uh, 
um, based on this theory of change and the target setting, first of all, it's like the, the more technical working group. So it's um, on uh, decarbonization, setting sector decarbonization targets, um, overall decarbonization targets. It's on data gathering. Um, it's um, everything related um, with to carbon accounting and how to achieve for investment portfolio um, and investment portfolio steering for a, a, a net zero investment portfolio, so aligning to a net zero by 2050. The second uh, work stream is on engagement. Um, key uh, for the alliance is asset manager engagement. Uh, but also we state positions and give guidance for bilateral engagement for company engagement. We have a policy um, engage uh, policy advocacy uh, work track and the financing transition, mainly discussing how to enhance the supply side for clean, for clean, uh, clean technologies. We have a communication work track um, and recruiting, which is not so much on the content, but also important. Um, as only if we are vocal and if we grow worldwide, um, this community will be strong and, and will have a huge real world impact. So we asked every member to participate to the work tracks, um, but there is no, um, you know, um, no, no, it's not mandatory uh, to, to contribute uh, for a specific time. But we feel anyhow it's important to be in those work tracks because it, you will benefit, so the asset owners will benefit from the conversations, uh, experience sharings from other asset owners. The tracks are asset owner led and everything, uh, so every work which is done is done by asset owners, so it's not commissioned. So it's an asset owner led initiative. Uh, please flip to the next slide. And this is a slide um, I uh, we created to, to confuse you. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it shows the complexity and it shows um, that uh, the approach is a multidimensional approach. For example, um, alliance positions, just to pick out, the alliance is um, already has a position in place on coal, uh, so phase out coal, but we are now working on a, a negative um, emission, so a net zero paper. And of course, all of this work needs to be connected um, with this uh, different work track. Um, for example, uh, sector decarbonization pathways are very much linked uh, to these positions, uh, but also finance. It has implications for financing engagement, but also policy advocacy. Therefore, the tracks work uh, interconnected and um, the tracks inform each other regularly to have a, a multidimensional approach and to have an approach that in the end is consistent uh, with, with the target setting. And, and with the ambition. We established uh, one month ago uh, the scientific advisory body with five organizations uh, supporting us uh, to ensure that the Alliance and the Alliance work is grounded on science. These institutions are the Potsdam Institute, um, IASA, uh, the UN Environmental Program, University of Technology in Sydney and the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, please uh, flip to the next slide, and this is, I want to give uh, some examples um, on how the Alliance envisions to have real world impact via the different work tracks. In, um, so the engagement and policy advocacy work track, um, investors with influence via engaging with corporates and sector association, which, which is kind of every known and um, um, CA 100 plus is doing a fantastic job. So we support CA 100 plus in collaborative engagement. This is nothing the Alliance um, adds, except that we uh, encourage Alliance members to support CA 100 plus um, uh, collaborative engagement. And we already know about success, especially from 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 uh, oil uh, sector, um, oil sectors. Now, if you think about Shell, BP and others, they move. Let's see with Exxon uh, next week. Um, I'm very curious how they will react on the ask. You might follow this um, on media. Um, so um, asset owners have impact on real economy. Uh, this is clearly uh, what we see. We are seeing. What is uh, possibly new is asset manager engagement, and this is a key theme of the alliance. Two examples. 
Um, the uh, Alliance um, has a, a group uh, doing um, or yeah, um, uh, they kicked off last year collaborative engagement with the largest asset uh, managers worldwide. Uh, and they asked uh, for updating their voting policies for uh, respective um, climate related public discourse, but also providing products. Uh, and we see asset managers uh, now also moving. Um, as you are, uh, of course, aware of the net zero asset manager initiative. So we are also connected to the asset manager in, um, initiative um, together and collaboratively working on, on climate solutions and climate solutions uh, products um, or. And this is, of, of course, pretty clear if the clients and, and uh, the institutional invest investors are the largest clients of the asset managers. If they request respective policy and respective products, um, for sure, asset managers, uh, it encourages asset managers to move accordingly. And this is what we are seeing. Um, you will find on our website also a guidance for asset owners for asset manager engagement. It's on climate related um, proxy voting, um, so which is open to the public. Uh, and we also hope. Uh, that um, yeah, th this will push um, um, asset managers um, into uh, uh, into well um, investing in, in clean technologies and in uh, transitioning companies. Policy advocacy, um, so uh, the alliance positions, uh, coal position, net zero position. Uh, this is also a clear uh, signaling, and and these positions are also used for policy advocacy. Um, locally, but also on a more international basis. And policy advocacy, just giving you another example, we are currently um, facilitating and working on a, on a um, closed door, but very high level um, uh, meeting um, uh, ahead and uh, in line or in parallel with the G7 and G20 meetings. It will be very high level with politicians, but also um, AOA uh, board level um, uh, members. Um, and um, so we are currently working on, on a carbon uh, pricing um, position, which we can hope uh, to address in these meetings. So basically building on the network, uh, which is all also available on, on, on board level with the respective uh, politicians. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, uh, very important and, and crucial is collaboration, uh, collaboration and engaging with other stakeholders and initiatives, for example, with a task force for scaling voluntary market carbon, uh, markets, where the alliance um, uh, is is uh, giving advice or is is consulting, um, we engage with a, a TCFD, um, of course, uh, requesting mandatory TCFD and supporting TCFD implementation in the various regions. We have a official collaboration in place with Keep PCAF, so on carbon accounting and also SPDIFI. And we uh, work together uh, via the asset manager engagement track with the uh, Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative. All of this um, is, of course, um, and this is the idea to set global standards. So being a global initiative like the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, and what we definitely need and want to and will grow faster in, in, in other regions, not only in Europe, but also in Asia and North America, in other regions, um, having um, engaging um, and being able uh, to push and drive global standards, this uh, for sure, and we hope will have um, well, we will impact. For the financing transition, giving you some examples, blended finance vehicles. Um, uh, we we work together uh, with other stakeholders. Um, and um, try to find solutions how to scale blended finance vehicles, which are vehicles um, with a de-risking feature um, to uh, achieve attractive for institutional investors, attractive risk return profiles. 
Um, so what we try to do is to connect the donor community with institutional investors and asset managers, building those vehicles, so raising donor capital uh, and supporting asset managers to build vehicles which are appropriate for institutional investors um, uh, to invest in. And what we also do is kind of <clears throat> giving educational sessions for asset owners, because what we are seeing, many asset owners are not familiar with those vehicles. So to explain the structuring, so trying to connect all those different parties um, to scale up those vehicles. This is one example for the financing transition. You see here many other <laughs> themes uh, we work on. I want to pick out uh, another one, which is discussing climate benchmarks. Very interesting to look into those benchmarks and understanding those benchmarks. Um, the alliance, the alliance members, wants to uh, basically do not really promote divestment. Divestment might be a, a last resort after unsuccessful engagement. But what we want to see and what we need to see is the global economy transitioning to a net zero. Um, and um, this is also something uh, we yeah, kind of want to understand how these benchmarks can support a transitioning rather uh, having divestment implications. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, um, with the financing transition uh, via a digital roadmap, which we plan to build, we want to connect climate solutions with uh, investment opportunities um, to provide transparency for all asset owners, which kind of uh, yeah, investable solutions uh, support uh, uh, the transitioning um, and the respective climate solutions. As I said, there is another theme about yeah, voluntary carbon markets. So if you are interested, we can do that in the Q&A. I don't want to go into depth to the other themes uh, as uh, uh, the time is limited. Therefore, please let's flip to the next slide. It's on uh, methodology, target setting, reporting and data where Udo is also specialist uh, and, and uh, very active in this track. Uh, <clears throat> basically here um, also engaging uh, with other initiatives uh, for example, data gather gathering, uh, we have a collaboration in place or are even member of the Alliance is a member of the uh, open source climate pushing for a global um, uh, open source tool for climate uh, data, um, not only for data, but also for in, in the end stress testing. What we also feel is needed um, to have a consistent uh, and global standard which can be used and be accessed by everyone. Last but not least, uh, also picking out here uh, what is also very uh, interesting to see is uh, this is the only thing the Alliance commissioned. This is a climate model um, for a sector decarbonization, um, which is informing the Alliance members on um, uh, um, sector benchmarks. Um, it's the one earth climate model. Um, and uh, this model can give kind of also input for other climate um, scientists, what is needed for asset owners um, for portfolio steering. So providing input specifically for asset owners. With this, um, so the Alliance want to be a role model, model and I guess Udo will elaborate more on that in, in his presentation. We want to set global standards. Uh, we um, <clears throat> want uh, to be uh, vocal um, and um, yeah, with our policy uh, advocacy um, on various uh, events. Um, enhancing supply side for climate solution investments is another theme. Being a leadership group, um, having influence um, globally, and then uh, which is relevant for asset owners, sharing experience, all of this, we hope to have real world impact to achieve a net zero. And um, I want to close with the last slide. Um, this is a slide um, which kind of um, shows and underpins that the Alliance is a role model having real world impact. It's um, the um, UN secretary stated that um, with the G funds representing 7 trillion uh, US dollars, um, he calls on all members to align as soon as possible behind the gold standard on credibility and ambition established by the Asset Owner Alliance that I convened. 
And this is an obligation to us to stay credible, to stick to the high and bold ambition, and to pull and push uh, with this community in partnership uh, with all stakeholders to have and achieve this real world impact. Uh, with this, um, I end my presentation. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you very much, Elke. <laughs> indeed. Um, thank you indeed very much for this elaborate presentation on, uh, on, on the, all the activities of the, of the Alliance for this deep dive in, in, in all that's happening and, um, and also for uh, yeah, explaining the real world impact and how it, um, how it, how it, how it is reflected in the, in the work of the Alliance. Um, I would like everyone to, um, yeah, to ask questions through the chat. Uh, I haven't seen any coming in yet, but um, maybe you gave just so much information. All the questions have been answered in your presentation. That could be it, but I can hardly imagine. Um, I, but I can imagine you've given us a lot of uh, food uh, for us. <laughs> and everyone is really just digesting all this information. <laughs> <that> <laughs> <laughs> and um and uh, which is uh which is great we have um actually a, a, a large number of um of asset owners of course in the um, in the in the webinar now and uh, what i was curious is that um okay if you're just one uh if you are just if you're one single um asset owner how can you as a single member of the alliance how can you then make real world impact As I, say, as I said, I see uh, the asset owners in the Alliance, the Alliance members um, being a community, working together, pulling and pushing together. And of course, every single member um, can contribute to that also um, with ideas, what you know they want to see um, work on because um, they feel or strongly feel this has a real world impact. And uh, if this member uh, finds other asset owners um, basically um, um, seeing the same opportunity, this one asset owner will have a huge community and can build a huge community to achieve what, what they think should be achieved. Like mm -hmm. uh, looking at or, or assessing climate benchmarks is like one example. This had been driven by one asset owner and said, um, so, so, you know, how do these benchmarks work? Uh, let, let, let have a look at them and, and, um, let's see, um, yeah, what, what are the overall implications and are they set in a way that they are consistent with the alliance ambitions on the overall ambitions to decarbonize this one examples. And there are many others. So basically it's the possibility uh, to drive as a one member um together with others which is of course much much stronger if you would be by yourself you, you will hardly even if you're a large asset owner you will hardly yeah. be successful um so it's the community basically um yes joining the forces there okay yeah thanks very much uh, yeah uh, so we have a question uh that's came in from uh louisa louisa Kranenberg. uh mm -hmm. i will uh i'll read it out i think it's for Elke, of course, um, and please ask you to explain how, uh, apart from guidance on the targets within the AOA, there's guidance on the MRV work track in terms of what parties can help to do uh, to, the, to do the actual analysis and measurement for the asset owners that have not uh, the internal research capacity. So the smaller asset owners, or, uh, how, can, uh, how can that work? In other words, are there preferred partners or could the AOA recommend organizations that have expertise mm -hmm. that as a can consult? Yeah. I think of it's course clear. The, yeah, of course, the Alliance cannot promote uh, single commercial uh, providers. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, what happens that that um, there is experience exchange. And uh, I would say one outcome of this exchange was um, to commonly work together and be a member of open source climate. Um, because this will be a tool where public data is gathered in a consistent and standardized way, um, rather than, you know, all those different providers and you see results deviating by uh, huge percentage points. 
um, you cannot tell which one is better. And as I said, um, th this cannot happen uh, by the alliance that we promote a single commercials. Uh, but I guess Udo might be also someone who can uh, elaborate on that more. But of course, the alliance gives guidance wherever. So it's more like a high level guidance. How, you know, what are the, the, the tools for decarbonization? Um, rather than uh, promoting single, um, yeah, data providers, let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I think this also relates to uh, something that has come up in the discussions we've had with asset owners. Um, so if you are a smaller pension fund or insurance company, uh, is it really feasible to join the alliance? Because, well, you just explained a lot of work that's done by the asset owners themselves. It's not... Uh, uh, um, done by others uh, uh, it's not uh, done by other parties so is that at all feasible to well with limited capacity to <laughs> to yeah to I, I definitely i mean as i'm also responsible for recruitment of course this is a question uh, which is um which i hear uh, many times of course mm -hmm. it is and there are examples so we we have small asset owners in the alliance which are quite active in in some areas Right, for example, engagement um, and uh, not that active in others. There are huge organizations which are on every single track. But as I said before, there is no time commitment we ask. So what we recommend or what I recommend is um, you saw all of those work tracks and I can give you, you know, there are so many work tracks. Just pick the work track you feel is of most benefit for your organization. So it's not. Um, you know, you should not think it's, um, you know, elaborate to be with this and you need to work. You can benefit uh, from it for your organization. So to use the tools and to kind of have ideas how to align investment portfolio or how to engage. So be together in this group is not only a time constraint. It also give you times and might even free up time for you. And it, it's it, how much you, you want to um, participate through this group. It's basically the organization's um, decision. So there is no, um, yeah, commitment or no mandatory time. Mandatory time you need to, um, uh, yeah, you need to contribute to the work tracks. Yes. Okay. You can so just you listen in, for example. Which yeah. is also <laughs> time consuming, <laughs> depending on how many yes. tracks you list in. <laughs> so, so many tracks indeed. One of the <laughs> one of the tracks that intrigued me was the one on policy efficacy, because it's often um, that you, of course, you have the private investments, and then uh, what, what you often hear is that, uh, yeah, okay, we want to invest more not well, sustainable in general, but uh, there's a lack of uh, uh, the governments need to do their part as well. Uh, exactly. Really. Read the standards and then, and of course, and then, and then the discussion stops. But I guess in this, um, in this working group, it doesn't stop. You actually have this discussion, right? Maybe exactly there's something I mean, on that. Exactly. I mean, carbon pricing is one huge, large theme, which is um, very complex. Um, but if you think about, like, really, for example, the building sector. Without regulation or, or also like steel cement, without regulation, you won't see anything moving because this green premium is just too high. So what we try to achieve is to also have like a regional um, um, policy advocacy. Um, I mean, this is of course very elaborate, but if we want to achieve um what um yeah uh, uh, pot net zero portfolio uh we need to see the change in the real economy and the building sector is a good example because here the asset owners are really the owner of the building so if you're not invested by a fund and of course as a client you have a lot of power um on the one side on the other side if you are a large group of investors in in the specific region or country um, you can, you know, together achieve, um, or you have the policy uh, possibility uh, to engage with a regulator. Um, mm -hmm. And we try to come up with those positions supporting the members um, with the track. So also, if you are a single member with some ideas, and and you say, look, this is needed. Please uh, support me giving this guidance. 
this is of course something which can happen in the alliance that we build a group of those um, asset owners to commonly uh, come up with a position and then in the end also um, um, do this um, engagement uh, collectively. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, this is very strong. And um, maybe before we go to Udo, I have one more question, um, which is, uh, could you really give an example of uh, an achievement that you've had on the, on the real world impact? I mean, this is a difficult question. Um, I could, you know, tell, you know, there is an asset manager who announced this and that after we had um, uh, an engagement conversations. This is something um, I'm not sure if we can state. Um, I, I could give examples, but I'm not even sure if it's only us. <laughs> and I'm not really sure, you know, if those asset managers or also uh, companies, yeah, if you look at some companies, if you see this very direct um, connections, of course, there might be, uh, but usually this is not stated, right? <laughs> Um, so, what I see engagement is a long process, um, but the longer this process takes, the stronger, the more, you know, capital is also behind it and asset owners behind it, the more we will see. And for sure, if you think about like one and a half, two years ago, um, opening up the newspaper or listening in on, on TV, the news, it, uh, climate is now much more present um, due to various reasons. One of it for sure is that, um, yeah, investors, but also like also policy, everyone sees that this is needed. And I think it's like a collective achievement we all have. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really difficult to say, you know, this is what would we achieve. There is a one to one relationship. Um, I, I would be careful to do yes, that. Yes, I agree. <laughs> That would, yes, all right. <laughs> I understand yeah, that. But lots is happening, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like this. Elke, thank you very much again also sure. for, for uh, answering uh, the, the questions. And um, if any questions come up for Elke, please feel free to put them in the chat uh, still while we move on to our next uh, speaker, um, Udo. Udo Lisa, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, thanks everyone, and happy to, to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, can we move to the next slide? So again, I want to start with the AOA and really a little bit explaining more how we work with others. Um, the idea of the AOA was created by the UN. So certain asset owners were asked by the UN if we could help or certain could help building such an alliance. And right from the beginning, the alliance, of course, is operating with the political capital of the UN, which of course helps us opening doors. Um, it does not help finding final solutions we have to do ourselves as asset owners. But of course, we operate with the political support of the UN, which helps a lot. And then, right from the beginning, the idea was really to have some, to have beyond asset owners, strategic partners, and to do a little bit, yeah, reality check, also be sure that we have the right ambition. And that's WWF and Global Optimism formerly called Mission 2020, which is my more well-known, uh, led by Christiana Figueres. Um, so this was the, was the initial setup. Um, and of course, in the center are the asset owners, uh, which are driving this initiative. Um, also, it might be interesting to hear that there is no legal body, um, which is the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. It's just the only thing which is really existing in the commitment by the asset owners. Um, over time, we saw that we need to really, as we want to be driven and based on science or strongly guided by science, 
that we want to have really a scientific advisory committee. You see the members, I think that was founded end of last year. So overall, the alliance is just one and a half year old. So it's growing. It's still growing. And then the two other buckets, which might be really interesting. The one is what we call supporters. Um, these are basically organizations um, like, for example, VBDO could be, um, which help us on recruiting, which say, yes, um, we are not members because we are not an asset earner, but we share the objectives. Um, and the first one we had or is, for example, the German Insurance Association. Currently, we are working on the French side with the Insurance Association. It's not yet done. That's really to have more, yeah, I would say national organizations of asset owners who just um, support and share the same objectives, uh, helping, of course, in recruiting and um, getting more global reach or more going deeper into certain countries. The other part is really formal collaborators. Um, where we really try to align methodologies. Um, the one is on carbon accounting, PCAF, which um, developed also in the last one and a half year, I think, into really the global standard setting, directly feeding into the greenhouse gas protocol. And of course, if you think about target setting for real economy companies, it's SPTI. And also, um, there is, of course, a strong overlap with the science based target initiative, as they also um, now have a target setting methodology for uh, financials. We are in discussions with SPTI how to align closer. Um, Let's see. It's always difficult if you have a little bit different history to to come together. But we see movement. The best outcome, of course, from our side would be that the target setting protocol would be fully fully endorsed by the SPTI. Um, this is still some work to be done, but in in general, there is an agreement that uh, convergence makes a lot of sense. And of course, in the target setting protocol, just there are there's the general comply or explain principle in it, or follow recommendations, or explain why you deviate. Um, of course, the science based target initiative is much stricter in their approach. Um, so there is, but there is room to come together. And yes, also here. We want to increase the formal collaborations really to, to, uh, to bring the different pieces you need in for asset earners closer together and really get it aligned um, and not and really cross referencing in the different documents uh, on the methodologies, standards, and so on. Of course, uh, that's we are just, uh, AOA is just 18 months old. This is not perfect yet, but it's really the direction everyone wants to go because I think everyone is suffering not uh, from a lack of initiatives. Um, I will come to that one also later. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, I think um, that's uh, G funds. The Glasgow Financial Alliance won at zero. Um, honestly, I'm not sure what will happen after Glasgow COP26. Um, currently, it's really the umbrella for different initiatives, which are all in the financial sector and the most ambitious ones and really um, drive all to net zero. And this is just before COP26, that there is an um, alignment between the initiative, common, yeah, also common um, Udo, 
Okay. Um, there you're back again. Okay, yes. I was muted. Yes. Now I'm back. You're back again. Oh, so you were just explaining on the G. Maybe after an hour I get muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. But and I think Elke discussed about real world impact. I would say for me the largest real world impact of the AOA is what you see on this slide. Um, when the AOA was founded and we from Allianz were founding member. Um, it, it was only September 19. The idea of asset owners committing to net zero was completely new. It was absolutely new. And honestly, when we committed, we thought also internally, what are we doing? We are the only ones. And yes, we had uh, 11 uh, friends in the AOA on that time. But this was really completely new. And it just took one and a half year to have a net zero asset manager initiative created. Um, IIGCC followed with their members uh, on the uh, net zero investment framework. We have the net zero banking initiative. So the whole financial world, all financial institutions now have an have now uh, an initiative they can join. And it, I would say from a yeah, quite exclusive club of people who no one were sure what they are doing, we now ha have it, it's really mainstream to commit to net zero following one of the initiatives. And I would say that's for me, the largest impact we so far had as AOA, that's really, from an abstract idea, a financial institution commits with its own whole portfolio to net zero, um, just to yeah, being mainstream. Um, whoever has a climate ambition now commits sooner or later to net zero. Some of our asset owner alliance already set out targets that they will work only with asset managers. Uh, which are committed to net zero asset manager initiative until 2024. So it's really moving in that direction and globally. And of course, uh, the whole financial market is moving in that way. Um, the impact will be there. We all know that a single asset owner is much too small to, to really have real world impact. So I would say the real world impact so far is really that financial institutions, whoever has an ambition now is at least discussing joining one of those initiatives. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, and of course it's not only G funds. Um, I don't know, currently uh, Net Zero Insurance Alliance is under discussion. Uh, for insurance companies to have also the uh, liability side of the balance sheet committed. Um, SBTI, of course, um, they have currently a little bit the problem that they most of their methodologies still rely on well below two degrees or two degree scenarios, but um, they are also, of course, moving to 1.5 as uh, two degrees um, yeah, is outdated, I would say. And yes, um, then there are regional commitment initiatives like the Dutch financial sector climate commitment and others. And what we currently see is that many, many of these initiatives are moving from below two degrees or two degrees really to net zero 2050 or 1.5 degrees, which by the way is not equivalent. Um, net zero means also having emissions every 10 years, which is a little bit stronger than net zero 2050, at least in the first 10 years. So everyone knows uh, the carbon budget is limited and we need to reduce quickly. So, and that's also the point why we need the short-term targets or the five-year targets. It's not about an abstract net zero commitment 2050. 
it's really all about, and that's the common theme for all the initiatives under the G funds umbrella, short term targets, move now, reduce now emissions and sending really a strong signal to the real economy companies. Okay, can we move to the next slide? I tried again, uh, Elke and my, uh, myself, yeah, to, to just group the different initiatives out there which are related to climate. And we came to 10 different groups which are out there and somehow also the AOA tries to navigate through that jungle of initiatives. So I would say there are, of course, regulators, uh, legislators, whoever is in the, based in the EU knows what is happening. Um, but then we also have those standard setters which are getting active, um, especially on the accounting side, the IIS board for accounting is moving much more to a climate focus. Of course, that's be GRI, the reporting uh, standard setters, um, which are in fact uh, impacting or affecting all of us. Then, of course, we have on the financial side, we have the regional investor initiatives, which uh, work together in the investor agenda in Europe, that's IIGCC, but it's Ceres in the US, it's PRI globally. Um, and then we have the financial commitment initiatives now all under the G funds umbrella. Um, and then we have the real society or here we have the, we have the research organizations. We have NGOs like WWF global optimism, and we have different organizations most or sometimes hosted by NGOs who do climate assessments like TPI, WBA, um, many others, CDP. And yes, then we have also companies um, and we have those initiatives who, who drive company target setting. We have the company associations, especially on the high emitting sectors where they are relevant for us. The Net Zero Steel Alliance, um, we have on the oil and gas sector, the oil and gas climate initiative and others. And yes, all of us, I think, and that was already asked in the questions, we all need data. It's all, we all suffer data problems and so the data providers methodologies stress the scenario and uh, analysis and other parts are really uh, more and more important also for the regulators and no asset owner can develop it themselves fully and on the other hand as climate change and climate change reporting and analytics will not go away I think everyone is fearing to, to just adding additional market data or external data providers to, to the cost basis we have every year. And what we really try to do in the AOA is a little bit to give guidance between all these different bubbles and figure out how to have this uh, ecosystem can really move jointly more in one direction. There are so many things out there and they are all working independently. And that's where we really try a little bit to, to bring air yeah, yeah, to align and see how these different organizations can work better together. Okay, then maybe we move to the next slide again that's a quick one it's really showing that the target setting protocol is used by asset owners 
we have now 19 who announced their targets in public. And honestly, I'm completely surprised by the ambition level. Um, we gave a range from 16 to 29 for the five years, but there are many, many which even go beyond. And the lower range is not used so far. So it's really amazing um, what level of targets we initiated. Um, then if we could go to the last, no, not yet, but to the next slide, that's also again a little bit from an asset owner perspective, what does it really mean to join the Alliance? And of course, joining the Alliance means setting targets one year later. And uh, there are internal efforts. And I would say the most important one is you need really in your organization top management support. If you do not have a board member who's really pushing for it, who really stands behind it, you can't do it bottom up in an organization. You need someone top down who says, yes, I want to make this happen and I want to have it in my organization. Otherwise, it's really difficult. Um, the other points, yes, target setting, you need to measure. and. For measurement, of course, you need a methodology, how to measure, and you need data, and that's workload. The only good uh, thing for European asset earners is usually you anyhow need to measure in the next years, because European regulation, the principal adverse impact indicators, the first three or four are exactly the carbon footprint of the portfolio, so um, you need to measure independently whether you join AOA or not. You anyhow need to measure in the next years just based on European regulations. So I would say from my perspective, the, the most effort intensive part is setting up a measurement for the portfolio is now requested by the regulator. So um, that argument at least for not joining or why its uh, efforts is gone, because you really see the overlap with the regulation. And also on regulation, at least many, and what I know, many, many of the asset earners use um, the AOA commitment to um, uh, classify their products as an Article 8 product, at least with the uh, environmental objective of um, yeah, climate or uh, decarbonization. Um, so there is um, a huge overlap with upcoming European regulation. Um, on details, yes, real estate is difficult. Um, and what really is difficult, at least what we hear from all members is, yes, if you have an idea of a target, how you want to set targets, the internal alignment processes are really long. Because it's basically, um, for most organizations, you always are used to some targets for your portfolio. Of course, you have whatever, PNL targets, return targets, um, risk targets, which you or more boundaries, and you are adding really a new KPI. And if you add a new KPI in the portfolio steering, there will many, many people suddenly looking uh, from a different perspective on, on climate change. That's really what we learn from the members is um, the target setting itself, coming up with targets you can do in two different ways. One is more bottom up, or you just say top down, I know what's needed. Um, but whatever you do, the internal uh, um, alignment, until you really are ready to announce with communication, then you have the com communication department or persons who need to be educated on climate change and others. And that's really um, a huge workload. And 
for the efforts and the alliance, I think, yes, there must be usually the CEO joining formally the alliance. That's manageable. It's four times a year. Then there's one senior representative for all general topics. That's, I would say, every two weeks a call. And then, as Elke already pointed out, you need to decide which tracks are you interested in, where are you anyhow working, where do you want to contribute. I would say, yes, no, no one is forced to join any track, but then it's also not really reasonable if you don't want to join anything while you are joining. <laughs> that would be a little bit strange. And yes, I would say if you join really a track and really want to join and collaborate there, that's effort, but you can really scale it. Um, really depends on, I don't know, currently, for example, we are quite active on the sovereign working group. Um, I don't know if you've seen the announcement um, on Friday that we want to set up a global sovereign assessment project here, then you, you of course have short on a little bit workload, but I would say the, the gains, what you really get is, um, you get collaboration with like-minded asset earners, you get the guidance on concrete topics. And yes, of course you get, um, positive external recognition. Uh, which you can use for your communication towards whatever customers, clients, of course, um, you also do it for an, or you use it for positioning yourself for branding of your company or your pension fund. Of course you do it. Um, in that way and use it in that way. Yeah, on the last slide, I think I skip. Um, I guess you will anyhow distribute the slides later. Uh, that's a little bit again the overview. Um, and yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Udo. Uh, thanks very much for again uh, a very elaborate presentation. Uh, this time on the AOA and also how it relates to all the other many, many initiatives we have. Certainly no shortage of initiatives as you just mentioned um, and uh, well, a lot needs to be done. So um, it does also make sense. Um, any questions, please, uh, in the chat and then um, let's see if we can um, have them answered as well. Uh, okay, we have uh, here one coming in from Katri, Katri Hoyman. Um, so um, I'm not sure if you can also read it, um, Uda, but Katri asks, um, so pension funds do not want to see different initiatives competing for asset owner support. And why do you think that groups like PRI not merge with net zero asset owner alliance initiatives or with those of other investment groups, like for instance, in the, the IIGCC? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. I would say you see everyone agrees on that one, but organizations have a different track record or history, so it's not so easy. Um, I would say with the G funds umbrella, you see already a first step in that direction. Um, currently, AOA and IGCC are working closely together to really see what can be done uh, jointly. Um, we also did, for example, uh, on sovereigns, um, there's now a joint project on sovereign assessment by AOA and IRGCC. Um, we are moving closer together. Um, it's really the different history. And of course, it's for some organizations like IRGCC. IRGCC cannot commit completely to net zero because they are 20, 20 years old. I'm sitting on the board, not all members. Um, the AOA started with the commitment, so everyone who's committed, uh, whose member is committed right from the beginning and nothing else. IGCC, of course, is an organization much, much older and many, many more members, around 300, and asset managers and asset earners. 
So uh, GCC cannot, as an organization, commit immediately to net zero without asking all the members, and that would also be difficult. Um, but it's moving now. IRGCC have this net zero investment framework, which is, if you look at the requirements, relatively close to the TSP. But it's not IRGCC. It's a it's a framework where members of IRGCC can commit to. Um, but of course, inside IRGCC, there are also some members who are not yet convinced that 1.5 commitment is the way to go and IGCC has to balance the view of all members a little bit um, so the IGCC cannot as an organization commit immediately to net zero and but uh, I can assure you well working really closely with both organizations being on the board of IGCC and co-leading the MRB track so that um, we are moving closer together. And honestly, the, it's not, of course, this is an AOA <laughs> a call, but the most important thing is commitment to net zero, which formal framework you are following if you go into the details you will see they're anyhow so similar and because people work <laughs> together and discuss it on a daily basis um, the most important thing is a net zero commitment if you join aoa it's great if you say we do it under the net zero investment framework of irgcc it's also great but commit to net zero Yes, thank you, uh, Udo. And um, yes, maybe I'm not sure if it's clear to everyone that IGCC and AOA also work differently. Uh, isn't that, um, is that, could you share something on that? Yeah, it's, I think the, well, there are different differences, of course. Um, of course, comes from the size. Um, IGCC is much larger, it's 20 years old, as said, AOA is 1.5 years old and um, just currently 37 members, um, IGCC more than 300 having asset owners and asset managers on board. Um, the idea of AOA is really to have it much stronger asset owner led, so all the working groups is led by asset owners. The secretariat is, of course, helping a lot in recruitment and also facilitating the work streams. But the main idea is that the whole work is done by asset owners. And it's really the asset owners behind it, standing behind it. So we from Allianz are very active in both initiatives but it's really completely different. IGCC, um, of course, is working broader with their members, is working through investor agenda, and of course, is the main host of Climate Action 100. And there, I think that's a good example. AOA immediately said, well, engagement, collaborative engagement, yes, we are all working into CA 100. And I think if you look at the AOA, members um we are jointly leading around 40 or 50 um ca 100 engagements from aoa members so it's quite common to be member in both organizations um but it's really a little bit different focus um because it's much more direct to the asset owners i think especially the part financing transition really immediately sitting on the capital and being able to direct capital into certain investments that's unique to AOA. Um, and there the point is really we immediately uh, it was easy to figure out that all the asset earners have demand on whatever low carbon investments 
or financing transition. They want to use their capital for financing it. But the problem is not the demand side, it's the supply side. And that, of course, is a much longer journey. Um, and yes, I think we are doing good progress there uh, on building up or working on a long term perspective of increasing the supply side. Um, but it's uh, the organizations, of course, now the both have a target setting framework, um, but the perspective is a little bit uh, different. But many, many members are anyhow operating under both uh, initiatives. Yes, and thank you. And, and on the target setting framework, um, which I think is also very interesting, of course, well, you mentioned so in your presentation that um okay it's not enough to have long-term very abstract targets we would really need to have more short-term like five-year targets and you know get started right now um so if you how long how, how do you how long does it take to set a five-year target and and, and 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 to do so what is expected then of an asset owner in the aoa yeah it's so how long does it take? I would say, it, yeah, you, it takes a year or it depends on your starting point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what you need, of course, to have in place to set targets is measurement. That's the data. Um, and, you, you know, and the target setting protocol is so far only covering three asset classes. That's listed equity, corporate bonds, and real estate. Um, so for corporate bonds and listed equity is the classical, I would say, calm footprinting. And then for real estate, it's a huge workload. Um, of course, um, you do not need all the tenants data, but basically it's uh, on building emissions. So it's including a tenant area. And I would say there, it really depends on what your portfolio is, how you're invested. Um, is it more, of course, um, calm footprinting on the listed side, it's much, much easier. Um, on the not listed side, it's still excluded in the target setting protocol because um, data are missing on the not listed side. So the one, and I would guess, yes, you need a year really to get the data have internal processes um, aligning on it, understanding the data, and then being able to set the targets. And on target setting, honestly, we've seen two different approaches by different asset earners. The one is you really take your portfolio, you see what can we do, what are the strategies, what, uh, which is the decarbonization rate of our invested companies, and you do it more bottom up and then you come up with whatever figure you do bottom up. Or you do it differently. You just say climate models are telling us we need to decarbonize minus 50% in the next 10 years. So the first five years, we take whatever share of that. And then you think later about, okay, how do I implement it? And really we've seen both approaches. Of course, the, the latter one is faster. If you just say, okay, minus 50 in 10 years is minus 25 in five years, that of course you do not need too long for. But then if you think about how to implement it, you're anyhow doing the same as bottom up. Um, it's basically the same workload and that really depends on are you working with an in-house asset manager? Are you working only with a two or three asset managers? Are you working with a 10 different asset managers? How to aggregate the data? It's really difficult to, to estimate in general. It, the more complex your setup in general is, so the more different asset managers, the more asset classes, the more diverse strategies, active, passive, quant strategies on the equity side, the more complex it gets, of course, because you need to, to have a little bit of solution for each different investment strategy you have in place. Yes, 
course, that that's, that's makes sense indeed, Huda. Uh, Thank you. Then I saw a question coming in from um, um, Mr. Van Lieshout. Um, so Menno, uh, um, asking some information uh, on the financial contribution for becoming a member of the AOA. Maybe it's a question more for you, Elke, to uh, get into. Yeah, Elke is somehow muted, but uh, <laughs> it's depending on the size. I think there are or um there's it's either you are below five billion assets under management you are believe between five billion and twenty billion or above twenty billion ah exactly no, you are yeah no Uri, you are better. completely right we have a fee letter so for the smaller ones below um ten a billion, it's 5,000 euros per year. Between 10 and 20, it's 10,000 euros per year. And uh, larger than 20 billion, it's 20,000 euros per year. And the first year is pro rata. So, first year is pro rata. So, if you join now, you pay roughly half mm -hmm. of the fee. So, all right. That is clear. Yes. So you want it's to just stating on the fee because some think, oh, it's so large. Well, we believe that the benefit is higher than what you need to pay because you learn so much for, from the, the the exchange. This is also what we hear from other members. So this is just what you need to uh, think through. Uh, not all, the costs is clearly understood, but possibly also what you can get out of it. Yes, it's both it's cost and benefit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And that's the analysis we need to make every each and every one. Okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Elke, and also thanks very much, Udo, for uh, answering all the questions. And um, we're moving to the well, to the end of this uh, of this webinar, and I would happily give the floor to to Nicholas and to uh, to provide us with uh, his closing comments on uh, what we have all just been discussing. Nicholas, please. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline, and uh, thank you also Udo and Elke to give this um, comprehensive overview of what, what does it mean to be, be a partner of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, uh, of, of what um, does it mean for in terms of real world impact and how does it relate to other, um, uh, other initiatives out there. Um, I do want to emphasize as a closing remark that, yeah, that the, the message, I think, from the scientific community has been clear for, for a while and it's becoming more and more clear that as we are experiencing the impacts of a warming Earth, it becomes more and more evident that we need to act uh, quickly. Um, and that is also kind of the message that we want to give to you, to the, to the asset owners on the call, um, because you are the, 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 the managers and uh, and, and the stewards of, of financial resources uh, and have the vested in, interest in our future and are, of course, very, um, have therefore also interest in um, uh, a more sustainable economy and world um, and um, could therefore also contribute to a, be, become more stronger act, uh, advocates for change. Um, and we, and we, what we also see is um, in the run up to the COP26 that this momentum among not only asset owners, but the whole financial sector is growing. We are seeing that it's critical to see private sector financial action. And a lasting success of COP26 will be, uh, will, will be very much enabled by action of the private sector. Um, so, um, yeah, what we have seen is the, 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 the importance of, of using your influence as a as a financial institution to create real world impacts. And Elke talked a lot about the different methodologies um, that they are uh, implementing, but also still very much learning um, to implement, um, which is to engage with policymakers, um, where, yeah, Elke also explained that it's very much uh, uh, driven by the asset owners itself. So if you have any ideas yourself that you want to act on, then you can bring that forward within the asset owner alliance to address. Um, it's also, of course, about um, engaging sector platforms and companies, which is very much already also being conducted by um, the uh, by the uh, Climate Action 100 Plus platform, of course. 
and um, there is of course the other a work stream of financing the transition where we have seen many different initiatives of how asset owners can become more involved in actually funding and finding and catalyzing the solutions that we need. Um, but another ad added value here um, for creating that real world impact is maybe kind of intended, but maybe also a little bit of unintended impact, which is that the Asset Owner Alliance was being set up one and a half year ago and has cross influence many other initiatives um, leading to that um, yeah, 1.5 degree alignment of, across the financial sector. So that's, that's another kind of real world impact that, that um, yeah, the Asset Owner Alliance has, has uh, tried to achieve or has contributed to. Um, one other element that has been mentioned, I think a couple of times is uh, the, 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 the smaller asset owners that might have limited, uh, that, that might have capacity or funding constraints. Um, and yeah, that's, that's of course a challenge that, that, is, that is present. Um, we hope and we see that for a lot of the asset owners, um, it actually contributes more than, than to, to your strategy as an asset owner rather than it uh, is asking from you. But of course, we understand that this is a difficult uh, consideration to have. Um, then, yeah, one last thing is that, of course, the, the, the many different initiatives out there, um, the Asset Owner Alliance, the Asset Manager Alliance, this Science-Based Targets Initiative, IIGCC, I think uh, Udo helped us understand them a little bit better and how the Natural Asset Owner Alliance is helping uh, asset owners maneuver through these different initiatives to reap the benefits of most of them. Um, but also, in addition to that, um, have some some uh, uh, yeah uh, additional elements. Um, what is also important to note is that of course we have a very ambitious uh, financial sector here in the Netherlands already with that has a Dutch uh, climate financial sector commitment on climate um, uh, that was signed um, uh, two years ago. Um, and we, we, we really applaud that, but also want to encourage to take the next step to create real world impact. So we really need asset owners. Uh, we really hope that asset owners can set this long-term goal of for 2050 in line with a one and a half degree uh, pathway and set these inter intermediate goals in line with a standardized target set of protocol, for instance, such as the one set out by the Natural Asset Owner Alliance. And also not only set these targets, but actually try to achieve these targets through uh, these real world impact initiatives that we have, um, we have heard. Um, so there are many different elements that we think are very um, innovative and helpful for the complete financial sector to um, make this move. And therefore WWF and FIBDO are also calling uh, on Dutch asset owners to um, uh, disclose the intention to sign up to the natural asset owners, uh, because if we have more and more owners that do these kinds of commitments, that will really help us create a lasting impact um, on the climate and also in the run up to COP26. So, as a last word, I think yeah, there are, there are many challenges. I think in in for for as an asset owners to navigate this space, but also in creating real world, world impact and. We hope that this webinar has been uh, somewhat helpful in navigating that a bit better. And we hope that you also, yeah, will all try to take on this challenge of creating real world impact, either through the Nets or Asset Owner Alliance or uh, through your own initiatives. Um, so yeah, thank you very much everyone for those contributions. Nicholas, thank you very much for your beautiful closing uh, comments and also uh, actually for your call to action to uh, all the asset owners to, to take the next step and be even more bold uh, in, the, in their ambitions. Um, I think we've provided a lot of information on uh, how it could be done through the AOA in this webinar. Uh, also with, of course, many thanks to our other speakers, Elke and Udo. Thank you very much again. Um, for your contributions and um, all of you have who have been participating in the webinar as well. Thank you very much for, for joining us uh, this morning and um, uh, listening in and um, 
giving uh, your uh, questions in the chat. It was a pleasure to uh, well to have this webinar, and um, well, I would say to be continued um, somehow again uh, in the future. Wish you all a very nice morning, and uh, thank you very much again. Bye bye. Thank you, Jacqueline. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.